Open stack physics, chapter 10, rotational motion, angular momentum. I just want you to know that I teach this class. I teach uh, algebra-based physics, and I think this is a great topic. I don't always get this far because there's a lot of stuff. If you really think about forces, work energy, momentum, collisions, uh, static equilibrium, rotational equilibrium, there's a lot of stuff. So sometimes this gets cut, and, and most of the time it does. I'll be honest with you, most of the time it does. Uh, but I'm going to cover it anyway. I'm going to make a chapter summary just to have a complete uh, summary for the whole, whole course in case you want to use this, then that's great. Let's talk about just a quick review uh, linear kinematics. Because this chapter is a little weird, it, it goes back to rotational motion, which we kind of talked about already. But I want to show you an analogy here. So let's think about. our linear kinematics. So we have things like this, S, S0, V0, T, plus 1 half A, T squared, where S is just any generic position that's a starting position, that's starting velocity, that's time, that's acceleration, that's time. Okay. And then we had, uh, we had V equals V0 plus A, T, and we had this other one, V squared, V0 squared, plus 2A, S minus S0. And those all came from the definition of velocity, the definition of average velocity, the definition of acceleration. I'm not going to read about those. So if we look at rotational motion, we can describe the position of an object with the angle theta. And if we look at the rate of change of theta with respect to time, we call that the angular velocity omega. And remember, we've already done this. The angular velocity, if I want to relate that to distance s, the arc length, if I relate that s to arc length, and the speed to v, you can see that the arc length s equals r times theta. Well, the same thing's true for angular velocity. v, the speed along the arc length, is r times omega. And finally, we have what we call angular acceleration, Alpha is the rate of change of omega. A reminder, that's the Greek letter omega. It looks a lot like a W, but it's omega, lowercase omega. So alpha is the rate of change of the angular velocity. Uh, and so we can do the same thing in terms of velocity. A equals R alpha. But this is the acceleration moving in a circle. We call this AT. This is the tangential acceleration. Because imagine that I have an object moving in a circle. This says, how is its angular velocity changing? And how is its speed changing? But we also know that at this point, it's accelerating because it's moving in a circle. So we can have two kinds of accelerations. AT, which is the tangential acceleration. It, no, that's AC. AT and AC. So AT tells you how the speed changes. AC tells you it's changing velocity due to its change in direction. Now, when we did circular acceleration, we, we I, I try to make sure that we only had things that change direction and not speed at the same time. But they could. They could. But since we have the definition of uh, angular velocity, the definition of acceleration, we can actually derive kinematic equations for angular quantities too. And we get theta equals theta 0 plus omega 0 t plus one-half alpha t squared, just like before. We get omega is omega naught plus alpha t, and we get omega squared is omega naught squared plus two alpha theta minus theta zero. So they look just like these, but instead of linear quantities, we have angular quantities. So when we have things moving in a circle and they're changing their angular velocities, then we can do similar kinds of calculations. They look the same, the equations are the same, because the definitions are from the same thing, and those things came from the same place. Okay, let's talk about forces. So we have another connection uh, between an analogy between rotational and linear motion. So remember this. I know, I'm sure you remember this. F net equals mass times acceleration. This says that the net force on an object changes the object's speed 
we, or velocity, and we call that the acceleration. It was a vector, and we had the mass. We also, from the previous chapter, remember that we defined torque as R, F, sine, theta. This is like a rotational force. It makes things, we looked at it in static case, but we said we don't want it to rotate, so the net torque had to be zero. But what if the net torque is not zero? If the net torque is not zero, and this is torque about the point O, torque net O is going to be equal to I alpha. And this is, this is important to see the connection here. Force, mass, acceleration, rotational force, torque, rotational acceleration, alpha. Then what the heck is I? I is the rotation. Where'd that come from? What the heck is I? I is the rotational mass. So this is like, it's, I call it the rotational But it's technically called the moment of inertia. It depends on the mass of the object and the distribution of the mass. Okay, so it doesn't just depend on the mass. It depends on where that mass is. So let me give you an example. Remember, if I have a large mass, with a certain force, I have a low acceleration. So mass tells me the resistance to changes in speed. Moment of inertia does the same thing. It tells me the resistance to change in angular motion. Okay, here's a quick demo that you can do. Um, so you could take this, this meter stick, I'm gonna grab in the middle, right there. And I can accelerate it up and down, right? And that change in velocity depends on its mass. I could also take it and change its rotational motion like this. So in that case, its change in rotational motion depends on the moment of inertia, which depends on how big it is and, and how, what the mass is. And I'll show you that calculation in a second. But I want you to get a feel for the moment of inertia. And why is my phone listening to me? Okay, so take it in the middle and rotate it back and forth. Now take it from the end and try to rotate it back and forth, it's a lot harder. So in that case, you can see you change the location of where the mass is relative to the rotation point, but you didn't change the mass. So the moment of inertia did indeed change. Um, in general, the book doesn't really say this, but in general, you can calculate the moment of inertia due to finite mass point masses like this. The sum over the points I, M I, r i squared. So you take each mass, you multiply it by its distance to the point of rotation squared, and then you add all those up. And if you have uh, finite objects like a stick or a sphere or a disk, we can calculate those two. You would need uh, calculus to do that, but don't worry about that. If you Let me just show you some. If you have a rod like this of length L, and, you, and a mass m, and you rotate it about the center, i is 1 12th, 1 12th m l squared. If you rotate it about the point at the end, i is 1 third m l squared. If you have a disc with a radius r and a mass m, and you rotate it about its center, i is 1 half m r squared. If you have a sphere, I is 2 fifths m r squared. And you don't need to know those, right? You just look them up in a table. But different shapes have different moment of inertias that depend on both their size and their mass. Okay. But the important thing is that that moment of inertia is your rotational mass. It tells you how difficult things are to change their rotational uh, motion, right? A larger moment of inertia means your angular acceleration is going to be smaller with a net torque. And it looks just like that. Now, remember that we had another way of looking at changes in motion. We have this. We could say F net is the change in momentum with respect to time. And uh, mass, momentum was mass times velocity. Well, surprise. Torque net is equal to the change in angular momentum with respect to time, 
where the angular momentum is i times omega. So you see how it all looks the same, right? Mass times velocity, rotational mass times rotational velocity. And now technically, 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 L, angular momentum, is a vector. But in, in most algebra-based courses, they kind of like flatten it out into two dimensions so you don't have to worry about that. Um, remember, momentum could be conserved. When would min momentum be conserved? Momentum is conserved if there's no external forces on our system. Can angular momentum be conserved? Absolutely. If there's no external, say it, torque. If there's no external torque, the angular momentum is conserved. So you can see situations like this. The famous one is that the ice skater spinning, when they move their arms in, they decrease their moment of inertia, and that would, in order to conserve momentum, would increase their angular velocity. Uh, another one is, imagine a motorcycle. Oh, I should have brought a motorcycle. A motorcycle jumping in the air. Uh, in, the, in the air, the motorcycle can change its orientation by breaking or throttling that back wheel. Because if you increase the speed of the back wheel, then you want to conserve momentum so the motorcycle is going to rotate the other way. Or if you decrease the momentum by braking, then you have to rotate the other way too. So you can actually change your orientation in the air. Um, that's con So conservation of angular momentum, when you have a system and the uh, external torque is zero. Yeah, that's it, collisions, okay. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff to do, but the problem is that I think angular momentum, except for the super simple cases in the algebra-based course where you don't use real definitions of torque, you don't use real definitions of angular momentum, you're kind of limited. But once you get into real three-dimensional angular momentums, there's some awesome stuff you can do. I'm just letting you know. I'm not saying you have to do them. I'm just letting you know. Okay, that's chapter 10.